So hello and welcome to everyone. We know that there will be more people joining as we get started, but it's lovely to see some familiar faces and many new faces here. This is the, let's see, this is our fourth uh, New Works conversation in our Regeneration series. This is going to specifically be on the topic of regenerative economics. And my name is Adam Lerner. I am the founder of Solvable and here with a number of my Solvable teammates, James Tyre and Charles Holmes. We uh, have hosted this series as part of our exploration in creating spaces in order to shift perspectives, build relationships, and really to celebrate new, new and important voices as we look to different paradigm shifts and how we might change our relationship with, uh, with communities, the social and planetary uh, context in which we all live. This conversation very much fits within, within that context and we're excited to be here. I uh, currently live in Vancouver, British Columbia, with, which is the current name for what is the ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil peoples. Uh, it is with great honor that I am here, although I'm also an uninvited guest and want to recognize that. If you also want to share any kind of land acknowledgement, thank you for, I see everybody sharing where, where, you're, where you're calling in from and great to see so many different places from around the world. I, we would like to uh, start with um, a centering exercise and I'm going to invite Ernesto to share a centering with us uh, from the Capital Institute and uh, over to you Ernesto. Thank you. My name is Ernesto Van Bebog. I'm in Buenos Aires, Argentina right now and I'm so honored to be in this space and, and, and share with you the next five minutes. We are about to travel to a beautiful place, a place that lives deep inside of us. So I invite you to close your eyes, sit in a comfortable position and relax in order to allow my words to guide you in this exercise. Connect with your breathing. Breathe in, breathe out, without effort. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe all the way in, breathe all the way out. Let's do this for three cycles. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. And as you continue breathing, turn your attention to your box of memories. This will be a beautiful journey. We are in search of our inner child. Let your memories unfold as if it were an album of your childhood. Do this freely. Try to find a moment where you reconnect with yourself as a young child. Take your time. Feel in your heart. Try to find a moment where you can connect with your childhood. For some of you, it can be a happy moment. For others, probably it could be a sad moment. That is okay. Both of these emotions live inside you. Feel it. Take your time. That moment will come towards you from the past. What is happening now is a deep connection between you now and you then. You're giving permission to your inner child to reach out to you. There is no time and space. All of this is happening inside you. Again, take your time and you, when you find a moment, feel it, feel the context, breathe. Feel how your heart beats 
now and then connect you're now connected at the most deepest level in you this is you you're coming together from past and from future embrace yourself if you feel like it put your arms over your own young shoulders or put your hand over your own young heart feel yourself here and now there and then and in your mind say these words i'm here for you everything is going to be okay you are safe we are here together and you are so loved feel connect with that light of the inner child inside you now let's slowly come back and reconnect to our breathing breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out and now you know that you are here for you that you can nurture your inner child anytime to become one again together thank you for that ernesto that was really beautiful and it's a great reminder in this work that we pursue of making sure that as much as is cognitively required that we also are entering the the heart space and the spaces of imagination and uh, really appreciate what you've taken us on as a journey to begin this process i also want to acknowledge uh today that uh this week we have lost a really uh, uh radical and important voice um, Bell Hooks, as many of you may be familiar, has spent, spent a career challenging the dominant narratives of patriarchy and nuancing our understanding of feminism for inclusion. She also recognized the significance of community for helping us to move from fear to possibility. As that's one of the primary intentions of New Works, I'd like to share one of her quotes in, in honor of her contribution and her important voice. She wrote in Teaching Community a Pedagogy for hope, of Hope, dominant culture has tried to keep us all afraid, to make us choose safety instead of risk, sameness instead of diversity. Moving through that fear, finding out what connects us, reveling in our differences, this is the process that brings us closer, that gives us a world of shared values, of meaningful community. So we carry, uh, Bell Hooks and her legacy into this conversation and the importance of community in being able to uh, discover the, the spaces of possibility that are emerging. And we are entering this conversation around regenerate, regenerative economics and what, I, what we think is a paradigm shifting moment in the ways that we've come to understand economics and the implications of economics for our well being. Uh, and sense of uh, sense of self and sense of community and sense of possibility. And we're very honored to be co-hosting this conversation with In Rhythm, who has done deep work in the regenerative economy space. And I'd like to introduce Alex as part of the In Rhythm team to, uh, to enter the space with us. Thank you, Adam. Uh, so my name's Alex. I'm on the In Rhythm team in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Ojibwe and Dakota lands. And, you know, so thanks again, Adam and the Solvable team. It's a great opportunity to be co-host for this wonderful conversation. Um, also joined by my team member, Jen, who you'll hear from later. And just really appreciate everyone taking the time to join us here today. And to also Ernesto for that beautiful grounding. I feel really relaxed now coming into this space. <laughs> Um, and I'm really, similarly to Adam, very passionate and excited about this topic. I think we're all here because we recognize that we need to be designing our economies and 
our systems broadly on the principles of pat and patterns of living systems and who better to inspire us on this topic than John Fullerton. So I'm going to introduce John. Um, some of you might be familiar with his work. He's the original architect of regenerative economics. He's also a philosopher, writer, and impact investor. And his story is pretty incredible. I won't go into too much depth. I'll let him give us the pleasure of sharing that. But after a successful 20-year career on Wall Street, where he was a managing director at JP Morgan in 2010, he founded the Capital Institute, uh, an organization dedicated to boldly reimagining uh, economics and finance and service to, to life. And I've had the pleasure of, uh, you know, knowing John from afar for many years and his work, but starting to work more closely together about two years ago. And in Rhythm now serves as an operational partner for Capital Institute, where we're really thrilled to have the opportunity to support and bringing his life's work to life. And it's been really inspiring to see how his work has uh, played a role in the lives of so many and continues to. And so, you know, I'll leave it at that. I'll welcome you, John, and invite you to kind of to kick us, kick it off and share a little bit more about your story with us and how you got here to this point today. <clears throat> sure, Alex, thank you. And um, thank you, Adam, and the, and the whole Solvable team for, um, for hosting this conversation today. I, uh, it's, it's a real, it's a real honor to to be, um, you know, in the spotlight, so to speak. So hopefully we'll we'll have a good conversation. Um, <clears throat> just my a little bit more of, of my story that that I think is maybe <clears throat> relevant to uh, to this discussion. I um, I left Wall Street in two thousand one, uh, really after sort of not being able to put down an itch that I felt and kept coming back. And, and then with the, the bank, I, I used to work for JP Morgan, we merged with Chase, it made it kind of easy to walk out the door, stock options vested. And I, I left with really no idea what I was going to do next, other than the culture that I had grown to love at the old JP Morgan had largely dissipated. And, um, and my, my, my instinct told me it was time to sort of pull up anchor and, and move on to something new, even though I really had no idea what it would be. I had already begun to um, uh, experiment with the idea of aligning capital with social purpose. Back in 1997, I invested Morgan's money in an Edison, in a, in a charter school management company. So I was, I was thinking about this idea of, of, of a capitalism that served a purpose beyond profits and, um, and have been wrestling with that challenge ever since. The, the, uh, the first day I went back into Manhattan after I um, had left the bank was a beautiful spring or fall day in September. And I had a meeting with another CEO of a charter school management company, happened to be downtown, happened to be at 9.30 in the morning. And you can tell where this conversation's going. It happened to be 9.11. And so I, uh, I was in the subway uh, at 9.10. And when I got to the street, the second plane had just hit the second tower. And that experience, sort of seeing, being there for that up close and personal, really pushed me into what I call sort of a deep think period of my life, very introspective, lasted many years. <clears throat> and it was in that experience that I discovered the ecological crisis as a systemic issue. I learned there was such a thing as system science, and you could get a PhD in it at MIT. Uh, and I concluded that, and I, and I discovered this the works, uh, for example, the Limits to Growth book was very uh, profound in my, in my uh, sort of relearning. And I, I concluded that the economic system uh, was fundamentally incompatible with uh, planetary health and with human well-being, despite all of its many positive attributes that had gotten us so far, but particularly the physics of exponential growth on a finite planet simply wouldn't continue to work. And this was sort of a, um, you know, a, 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 an overwhelming existential crisis of belief and worldview because everything I had learned to be true, I had to now question. Um, and so that led me into this, this search for an alternative way forward. And that ultimately led me to this idea that uh, living systems held the answer to how sustainable systems really work, really very much uh, following the footsteps of, of many folks um, uh, from the regenerative agriculture 
community from uh, Jeanine Benyus in biomimicry, um, uh, Herman Daly in ecological economics. And, um, and it turns out uh, the wisdom of all of our indigenous ancestors. Um, so uh, the, the work I'm interested in now is trying to um, uh, map this idea into a modern context grounded in our latest understanding of how living systems actually work. Uh, it's just the beginning of a, of a journey, and, um, uh, but that's the purpose of Kepler Institute is to explore uh, those questions. Then the final thing I just, I'll just say, um, I, I moved to where I'm talking to you from now about a year ago. Uh, I'm now in Stonington, Connecticut. And one of the things that, it's a beautiful place, it's about halfway between Boston and New York on the coast. Uh, one of the uh, intriguing things about it is that it's the land of the Pequot and the Pequot were famous uh, for their uh, use of wampum as a, a cultural artifact really, but then with the Europeans, they began to use wampum as a, as a currency. And so it, in a sense, I live where currency innovation and economic innovation first began in North America. But I learned only six months ago that I also live in what I think is correctly understood to be ground zero for the genocide on, uh, in North America. There was a, a massacre in a, in a town just down the road called Mystic. And uh, the Mystic Massacre is, is actually the first intentional uh, genocide that occurred in North America from what I've learned. So I'm speaking to you from Pequot country. Uh, like Adam said, I'm an uninvited guest, uh, very privileged uninvited guest. Um, but the, the meaning of this place seems to hold special, uh, special purpose for my life work, uh, which I didn't even realize when we decided to move here. So how's that for too long an introduction, Alex? It was great. Thank you for the thank you for sharing that story. I think it's really important. And I also appreciate particularly, John, your contextualization of the conversation around economics in indigenous culture. Uh, I um, I've been particularly uh, interested and captivated by the work of David Grabner, as I uh, shared with you um, in his book uh, on debt. And I I, I'm very cognizant as we open this conversation together that you've done an incredible amount of thinking and a great deal of contribution in this, in both the regeneration conversation around regeneration as well as the conversation about economics. But we're appending two terms. And part of what we've been doing in this series is we're having a regeneration conversation more broadly. And then we're looking at these eight different dimensions. I am, uh, I'm, I'm really curious which way you would like to do it, but I'd like to break down these terms in two different components, which is to either start with the economics and your understanding of economics in a, in a contemporary lens that is also looking backwards or start with regeneration and then add the other term to it. So how would you either start by defining regeneration or defining economics? And then how does the appending of the other term change in understanding? Interesting question. Um... So I'm gonna pick starting with regeneration because <laughs> um, it's a bit more real. Um, and, it, and it's really, um, I think where we, where we need to start. And, and my, my understanding of regeneration, um, uh, well, it doesn't even, it, it came from several uh, experiences and, and learnings, um, Bill Reed and Regenesis Group in particular um, but also my work on grassland management with the Savory Institute, um, which is more of a regenerative agriculture context, um, whereas Regenesis is more of a regenerative community built environment context. And I, I literally was, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a sec. So, so for me, regeneration, and this is the critical distinction, regeneration is a very real process. It is, it is a thing. It's not just a different word for sustainability. It's the process that living systems demonstrate that enables them to be sustainable. Um, and so its relevance to economics is um, uh, contingent on the, the belief that an economy needs to behave like a living system. Otherwise, the regenerative process is not that relevant 
to economics. So one has to first make a fork in the road decision. Is the living economy, is the human economy a living system or does it need to behave like a living system? And my argument in favor of that, out of that, uh, of, the, of a yes answer for that is that uh, it's very clear that human beings are living systems. That's not debatable. Um, and, and human beings do exhibit the regenerative process. Literally at a cellular level, we regenerate ourselves on average every seven years. And if you believe or buy into Gaia theory, and even what many cosmologists are now describing about how the universe works, it too is a living system, uh, self-organizing, self-energizing, um, uh, ever complexifying, ever evolving in a way that, you know, James Lovelock first described Gaia theory uh, for the planet. Um, it seems increasingly, um, uh, it, it seems that science increasingly understands that the planet and the entire universe is a living system. And so if, if that is true, and if human beings are living systems, and everything in between is a living system, how is it possible that the human economy, um, which is the primary way humans interact with the living system of the biosphere, um, and generate our well-being and our purpose and our meaning, how is it that that system could be anything other than a living system if it's to be sustainable? Um, flipping to, to economics, um, I've studied the history of economics much more since I left Wall Street than I was taught in college or in the training program at JP Morgan. And it's actually quite interesting intellectually, but also a bit terrifying. But the history of neoclassical economics, which is the foundation of all economic um, theory today is rooted in Newtonian physics and some assumptions that the early neoclassical economists made that if there are natural laws of, you know, gravity, the, 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 the energy laws, um, there needed to be some analogous laws of economies. And they literally made assumptions about uh, formulas in the physical laws and assumed that they applied to economic laws, even though the physicists at the time told them that was a silly idea. Um, so we've, we've, and we've built on top of that foundation, uh, lots of complexity to deal with the uncertainty. So we've added, you know, econometrics or probability theory applied to economics is essentially a way to deal with uncertainty as a way to try to solve the, 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 the questions that the models weren't answering. But as anyone who studied statistics knows, the, the, the relevance of econometrics is only real if we have what, are, what is understood as a normal distribution of, of outcomes, meaning that the, uh, the, the, the causes of, of that volatility are disconnected meaning they're random, like rolling of a dice. That's what gives you a, a nice normal distribution. But we now know that, that the world is actually complex and nonlinear. And yet we've got an entire economic theoretical framework built on an old foundation of Newtonian physics with a layer of probability theory sitting on top of it to explain the uncertainty. And it's no surprise that our economic models and our financial risk models often miss the, um, the, big, the big risk events that happen. And so we've, we've been through this series of, of, of catastrophic events, uh, what we in finance call tail risk, um, meaning the, the parts of the distribution that don't behave as a, as a linear distribution would. And we're sitting here questioning, well, what's wrong with our models? What's wrong with economics? And I would argue that at its core, it's as simple as uh, we, we don't understand that economics is actually a subsystem of ecology, process ecology, and we behave as if it's a extension of physics with some fancy mathematics layered on top of it. And so the models don't work, the theories don't work, and increasingly um, we're missing, you know, we, 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 we refer to things like externalities when they're actually, you know, like, like climate change, we refer to as an externality, but it's actually designed into the system because the system is built on a, a false set of assumptions. So I'll leave it at that. 
<laughs> I feel like there's so much to unpack there, John, and you've just given such almost a rich history of the foundations of the way of what our economic models are built upon. And really, we've been applying this mechanistic approach to a living system, right? If we if we're building on the premise that the economy is a living system and and it's not working, and I wanted to invite you to comment on you know in recent conversations we've had, we've been talking about the role of regenerative potential, and I wondered if you could speak a little bit to how you're seeing the role of potential in living systems, and you know making the parallel to that and how that shows up in an economic context. Sure. Um, so, so I guess, I guess where I would start on that, I mean, these are all, <laughs> these are all big topics, by the way, this is a plug we're, we're, we're launching a course on regenerative economics in the spring. So there's no possible way to, to respond in, in any meaningful way in a, in a, in an initial conversation. So, um, come join the course and help us figure this out. But, um, I think, I think. Where, where I see regenerative potential coming in is that if one deals honestly with the challenges facing us, um, we've got a we've got seven and a half billion people going to nine. All seven and a half of them want to raise their living standards, which all else equal means heavier material throughput, heavier footprint. Um, we have dramatic inequality, so we need to somehow redistribute the balance of, of, um, of well-being within the current context, but in a, in, a, in a context where there's more people who need more um, material uh, wealth, and we're at 410 degrees Celsius, we need to be at, uh, sorry, 410 degrees, 410 parts per million carbon in the atmosphere, we, best understanding, we need to be at 350. Um, and we need to transition the entire energy system. Importantly, we need to transition the global agriculture system at the same time to use natural carbon sinks. Um, and, you know, we need to reinvent cities and transportation and all this stuff at the same time. And all of that requires energy to accomplish. It's not like we can just flip a switch and and be on a different energy system. You know, it costs energy and materials to make a wind farm. Um, if you're honest with that predicament we're in, you either go to a place where some of the degrowth folks go, which is that we need to radically shrink the economy and probably the population in order to pos have a possible chance to not break the system into smithereens and destroy uh, the ecology that underlies our societies. Um, or you're not being honest with the challenges that are facing us and, and you convince yourself that we can electrify everything and do this and do that and, and, it, and we can go, go on business as usual. I, I think the, the tension between trans, you know, doing all of the uh, economic system transformation work we know we need to do and and, and you know and, and renewable energies is, is the simple way to 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 um, you know summarize that but there are many many other things that we need to do um, the only way to to um, come away from the enormity of the change that needs to happen without concluding that it's either not possible or it's or it needs to be done in the context of a radically shrinking global economy um, and therefore shrinking ecological footprint is to understand that there are many things we currently don't see. Um, and there are many possibilities uh, out there that living systems have generated magically over the millennia again and again. And, and I go back to almost, you know, ground zero um, or squ square zero, the, the, the relationship between the earth and the sun is just right or we wouldn't have life on this planet so by aligning the earth and the sun in right relationship that created the potential for life by aligning two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule um, that created uh, water in right in right relationship that created water water creates the potential for life 
and and my my bet is and my belief is and i've seen examples of this in the real world so i've, I've experienced this is that if we can move our current degenerative economic system into alignment with the patterns and principles of living systems we will unlock a massive potential we currently don't know don't see um, and, and, and can't even possibly imagine. And um, just to kind of give a, a little clue for the future, I, I'm just recently understanding that at its heart, this is a lot of what this whole cryptocurrency movement is about. Um, but there are many, many other examples um, uh, of potential being unlocked that the rational analysis of how much carbon we're emitting and what needs to happen and what needs to, you know, all of the rational reductionist thinking, you know, is, is missing the regenerative potential. And so the regenerative potential is really the reason to remain hopeful. Um, and, and, um, and, and yet uh, it's not just sort of a naive hope, it's actually hope grounded in uh, the magic, the beauty, the brilliance, the genius, uh, the incredible possibilities that living systems um, uh, have, have demonstrated. Um, so, uh, you know, for, for me, it's, it's a little bit of a both end. We need to do all of the hard linear analytical um, uh, rational stuff we know we need to do, and we will wake up and say that won't be enough. And then we need to get clear on how to unlock this regenerative potential. Uh, that vision, I think, is really compelling, John. I mean, I, I think that there's the two pieces that you identified. One is the kind of complex layering of uh, models and frameworks on top of models and frameworks to deal with the uncertainties uh, in the system and try to create this kind of corrective force are, are, are hard to... Um, I find are quite hard not to pay attention to because they capture attention and whether that's in the academic circles or it's in policy circles, people come up with these new frameworks and that seems to capture attention at the same <laughs> uh -oh. Oops, I think we lost Adam right at the crux of it. Um, well, since I'm not in his brain, I'm not 100% exactly where he was going with that, but I will just go ahead and jump in. I know we wanted to ask you, John, about your eight principles and how you came to arrive at those. Um, and we can drop a link in the chat for those who aren't familiar, but I think we're really interested in this conversation to get a sense of how you designed those, how you ended up coming to the realization um, that those eight were the eight. Well, and, I, and, and picking up, I think, where Adam was going, um, where there are lots of frameworks that people put out there and, and, and what's different about the, this framework than the 15 others that various consultants might, might throw out. And, and, and I would be very quick to say that these are not my ideas. Uh, these are one man's articulation as best I can to describe what's indescribable in linear language and in a finite number of principles. Uh, and and what, what I'm trying to describe, oh, and in the context of a global economy, as opposed to in the context of agriculture or the context of uh, real estate development or the context of material design and product design. So um, I, I don't know where, Adam, I think we, uh, I think we captured your Apologies. Yeah, I caught the tail end. I don't know what happened to my connection. <laughs> yes, I think that that you. I think you where you were picking up was um, where I was also headed. Is that you know we we have to sit with these the challenges to our attention, which is we're looking at in we're looking at innovation and incursions into present systems, and how do we hold the interventions? simultaneously with the kind of paradigm shift um, being frameworks, because I think that there's many of us that are on this call and drawn into this conversation that are really saying kind of like, forget the thing over there. Like we, we now have like, you know, huge bodies of evidence to prove that the foundation that, that neo as you said, neoclassical economics was built on was really flawed. 
Uh, and so let's create the thing anew, but it's running, it's, you know, it's doing it within an existing system with, with existing, um, with large, large uh, systemic implications. And so I think the question is, you know, to me is how, I wonder about how you reconcile how we shift this narrative, shift the narrative, um, especially when the, within the context of institutional entrenchment around the, the, current, uh, the current ways of operating. Mm. Well, that's a little different question than where I thought you're going. So now I need to, I need to rethink a little bit. Um, so, I, uh, well, the institutional, um, well, let me, let me make, make a, a, cu a couple of comments. So I, I was, I was halfway down a different track. So I'm, I'm rewinding my brain. Well, you can go down that track no, and no, we can go back okay. to the other one later. Um, so I, I think the, I think one, one thing to say is that a lot of the new economy conversation, and I, and I may have done myself and the work a disservice by referring to my eight principles as principles, because the word, the, the intention of getting clear on principles is to kind of get as close to quote truth as one can, getting back to ground zero, square, square one, what do we know to be true and build back from there? If you're lost, you need to get back to, um, to first principles. Um, but we also, we society use the word principles somewhat interchangeably with value system. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of confusion between um, various uh, proponents of new economy transformations that are arguing from a value system point of view. Um, as opposed to a, a um, grounded in reality, uh, this is the way the world works, uh, physical, mechanical, chemical, um, scientifically valid um, uh, uh, principles-based approach. And um, my hope, you know, getting back to the, the institutional inertia and, and difficulty is that um, there is some possibility to uh, inspire in people something that they just feel in their gut to be true. You, it's like you, when you see it, you, you know it. And we're not good enough yet at articulating this idea of regenerative economy to cause that like immediate, there's truth here. Um, but if it's true that the universe behaves in a way that is describable by patterns and principles of living systems. And if it's true that human beings um, uh, are describable in those terms, then um, if we get better at, at articulating them, as difficult it is to do that in linear language and in bullet points, um, it's probably easier to do with a picture uh, or some kind of creative um, exercise than linear language. But if it's true, then you, you create something that once someone has seen it, they can't unsee it. And then you've, you've sort of, you've, you've planted a bug in, in their brain um, that they have to wrestle with. It's like a, it, it becomes a, you know, a knot that they have to work on consciously and unconsciously. And so getting to the question about institutions, um, Someone once said to me, institutions are institutions because they're really good at not changing. Um, that's what makes them institutions. And so I actually hold very little hope that we will be led into some new paradigm by our institutions. Um, and you know, my kind of hypothesis on crypto is that it, it's interesting to note that Bitcoin arose the year after the financial crash. 2009, although it was on, you know, in the works for years before that, but then this whole DeFi movement is probably a direct. So, so I think Bitcoin is a response, or I've learned Bitcoin is a response to mostly emerging market economies who have governments who allow, you know, mass inflation and currency collapse, and so it, Bitcoin is essentially it, it rose out of these kinds of countries. 
um, and is a response to that. And the DeFi movement is a response to the complete lack of trust that the financial crisis, um, it was sort of this, the final stake in the coffin of, of trust in the banking system. And so um, the institution of finance, I would say, has already been undermined by, by their own actions. And what we're now seeing is a response, a, a, a protest to, and then a response. And the, that energy is re, re, restructuring itself almost in a metamorphosis sense into something that is unknowable and unseeable. And frankly, most of us over 35 years old will probably never understand uh, what's really happening. Um, so, I, so I think the institutional thing, I, I, uh, as terrifying as it is, I think a lot of the institutions in modern society have outlived their purpose. Certainly the, in, the big institutions of economics and finance are, are, are gonna need to undergo uh, either profound change or they're gonna need to die and reinvent themselves in, in, a, in a new form. And, and the hopeful thing is that that's already happening. It's just happening, it's still below the radar. So if you, if you tune into the news, you hear about the stock market and you hear about you know, a big merger and you hear about you know, uh, um, uh, SPACs and stock prices, but that's all the old system. You don't get to watch the news about this new system that's emergent uh, under the radar. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think the, the example and the contrast, which I, which will open up our breakout room conversations, is really to consider what you're sharing about institutions and their um, their uh, resistance to change and. Uh, by very principle um, of what they are, uh, and at the same, and the distinction that we have in communities, and what's actually happening at the community level, and how many of us, depending on where we live in the world, can feel some of that sense of change much more radically. This is the context that, and I'd like you to come back to your work in regenerative communities and how you see communities playing a role as we come return from the breakout sessions. Sure. We, uh, we're going to go into the breakout rooms together and these are going to be uniquely, uh, we usually do these in kind of triads, but this time we're going to try facilitated breakouts. So we're going to have larger groups of eight to 10 people. And we're going to be um, chatting about the question of, of how can communities accelerate our path to planetary regeneration? So this will be specifically about the role of communities, and then we will come back and, uh, and share back, and hopefully, John, we can get your take on regenerative communities then. Welcome back, everyone. Hope that you had lively discussions in your Go. breakout rooms. We would like to open up the space for anyone that well, would like to- the dog some discipline and training. I'm just going to mute everyone and then Adam and John, if you don't mind unmuting yourselves, okay? Human and dog pot. Got it. So we'd like to open the space for anyone that wants to share um, perhaps what was coming up in, in your room in the conversation that was particularly resonant for you. Would it, if you would like to share, please unmute yourself and James will spotlight you. <laughs> We, we talked about how um, a lot of localization occurred at the beginning of COVID when we were forced to stick to our communities and just mute, uh, stick to our communities and, and our local areas and the lots of stories of people getting back to nature and exploring nature within strict boundaries around your homes. But the discussion we had is we see that slipping away and how can you make that stick before all that excitement and enthusiasm at the beginning uh, is lost. We had to, I'll jump in and maybe summarize for our group and anyone can feel free to jump in. And sorry, Raj, I know you were in the middle of sharing when we ended, there's never enough time. Um, so some of the key themes that came up in our group were the role of uh, small and medium-sized businesses and how <laughs> those enterprises can really be an anchor and a channel to for regeneration in communities. Um, that was definitely a key theme. Um, connecting to our bodies as a way to connect to the earth. There was some incredible wisdom and stories shared around that and acting in deep reciprocity with and as the earth. Um, a couple of other you know, key wisdom moments were moving away 
from sustainability and not seeing people as machines, kind of as a just shifting that mindset around not seeing people as machines towards seeing them as whole people. And, and lastly, the role of understanding place and listening to the ancestors of our place and what they feel is needed. So, so those are some of the insights shared and anyone from my group's welcome to jump in and add anything I might've missed if they would like, but. I can add that uh, the last thing that we are talking is about uh, at the same time in the virtual connections, not connect us to the space, the local space, but also that that virtual connection must be part of that solution. So how we far away can inspire ourselves and act lo uh, locally. I'll just jump in quickly because they're, they're just comment on one of the pieces of uh, of the conversation with uh, with the great people that were in my group from all around the world. Um, this piece around the importance of the personal work, and from where am I sourcing my response to the current condition, and why that is so important, given the uh, the, the extent and depth of uncertainty and prevalence of fear and exhaustion. Uh, that exists now and just want to acknowledge in particular Raphael the poet who is in our group it was it was just we could have easily spent the next couple of hours together so thanks to everyone for that I can jump in um I really appreciated the group that I was in and um, I mean, a po poet would be cool, but I, I like my group too. <laughs> but uh, I, I love the um, conversation around what it is to be a community and how I feel like, or we discussed how maybe society needs to have a relearning approach to what is community and a practice about what it is to be successful and how to measure success and growth. And then, um, Andrew Thomas and I don't know if you feel comfortable sharing with what you revealed about the cultural awareness training but I thought that was so cool and the potlatch I just love that especially in this season of the holidays do you mind sharing that sure I'd be uh, delighted thanks Jennifer yeah um, so we're working on a project on the North Shore here in West Vancouver and um, we just recently uh, began an engagement process with the local First Nations, which is uh, Squamish Nation. And um, we had a session yesterday uh, to provide us with some cultural awareness about their history and culture before we kind of engage with them. And one of the things that really st struck a chord with me, I mean, all of it was really interesting and um, quite surprising how limited my knowledge of their history and culture is, but um, was the concept of a potlatch where the um, local families would host a potlatch where other inv other families would be invited to um, to visit and they they would measure their success by how much they were able to give away which was uh, not well received by the settlers from Europe who took rather the other point of view, which was uh, they would measure success by how much they could accumulate. And so it was just really struck a chord in terms of that fundamental difference between um, cultures that had been very in tune with the land and uh, saw themselves very much part of it and, uh, and how that then reflected itself in how they measured their success. I'll just share briefly from our group, which is, I think we had some similar themes and maybe John, this is a good segue to be able to bring, um, bring you back into the conversation, which is specifically the, what, um, and what Tomo was alluding to, which is this, this sense of how do we, how do we regenerate communities when we don't, when we don't yet have a sense of what that actually feels like ourselves. And so in a regenerative economic sense, we understand, it seems like, you know, many of us 
especially in an urban context, understand community through notions of exchange um, and, and commercial, particularly commercial exchange. And I think that one of the things that um, he was bring, bringing up through the potlatch references, other versions of exchange. And in fact, one of the things we were talking about in our group is the relationship to time and mobility. And so once you change the relationship of, I mean, you mentioned even being in the community, community that you're in for just a year. And this is something that's true for many of us that we come in and out of communities rather than having kind of a community that we're in for our whole lives or multiple generations. And I wonder particularly your thoughts on kind of this sense of how do we, how do we both imagine and create the, the regenerative communities that we desire without a felt sense of even knowing, as Julia Kim in our group said, even who our next door neighbor is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, it, the, the, where should I, where, where do where I start? Maybe, maybe I'll start just uh, observation about my own sense of community here. It's interesting if you <clears throat> if you look on a map. Um, I actually now live at the extreme opposite end of a fractal pattern of where I used where I grew up, and and the other extreme end actually happens to be Wall Street. Um, but it's in the same bioregion, and I it, I could explain this in more detail with a map in front of us. But it but for me, I very much feel like this is my place, and I'm just at the other edge of the same place, um, um, which isn't to say that a lot of people don't move, like you said, and, and feel um, needing to build community in, in new places. The thing, the thing that I would, I would start with is um, on, on, on how to hold this community idea is that the, one, one of the principles that I identified or qualities of living systems is that they do operate in the con in a unique context of each place. And so the, you know, the Pacific Northwest of North America is a different bioregion, a different place, has a different energy, a different geological reality. Uh, that affects human cultures that have grown, grown up there. And that obviously affects uh, the nature of an economy in, in that place. Can be very different than in, you know, say, you know, Northern Africa, for example. Um, and unfortunately, our global economy is sort of, you know, we, we commoditize place and, and measure things in terms of sales rather than contextualize um, values. And so reconnecting to place, I do think is fundamental to this whole regenerative economy idea. Um, the work of Regenesis Group is, is probably the best I've seen on place. And, and I highly recommend people to to go um, explore that, that they describe the essence of place in the same way that there's an essence of every person and that the essence of place um, uh, actually is, is what's seeking to unfold in each place. And we, I think we have to recognize that our globalized economy has just run roughshod over that. And we can't quickly just sort of pretend that didn't happen and reverse it, this, this challenge of reconnecting into place and creating meaning in place is, is a multi-generational uh, task that's ahead of us. The, the final thing I would say though, is that place is just one of the qualities of living systems. It's not, it's not the description of living systems. And so there's a lot of you know, advocates for local economy and that's been a big movement, but that's not the kind of silver bullet either. Um, the, 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 the framework that I would propose is that we need to hold place together with all of these other qualities if we're going to unleash the potential of a regenerative economy and unique to the context of the modern, of where we are. So there, there is something called the internet. There is uh, global transportation. And so how that affects this idea of place is quite different than it would have uh, if we were living at the, you know, a thousand years ago and, and in, in much more uh, indigenous uh, lifestyles. So 
uh, it's, it's really complex, um, um, but I think we all, probably everyone on this call, and I think most people, if they allow themselves to experience it, do feel something different when they, when they feel connected to place. And, and, you know, the comment about, we don't even know our neighbors, that, that's a symptom of the problem. That doesn't mean that we couldn't um, build community in, in, in place. Yeah, I think there's such a, a need for reconnection to place and honors place and community is one of the principles of regenerative economy. So I would definitely um, in, encourage anyone who hadn't had the chance yet to check that out and maybe uh, just transitioning the conversation a little bit, would love to have the chance to ask you, John, a little bit about how you see the role of modern finance um, beyond just the single-minded pursuit of optimizing returns, of pr producing a profit um, in this transition to a regenerative economy? Yeah, um, I, I'll try to be succinct because I know we're, we're running out of time. Um, I mean, the, the big idea is quite simple. It's simply to, well, to, to start and recognize that the financial system has kind of run roughshod uh, over, over much of the economy and therefore society. Um, and, um, uh, and, and most of our responses have been, you know, mitigating problems, mitigating yesterday's problems rather than fundamentally rethinking the design of the financial system, the design of the money systems at a, at a much more profound level. And um, so, you know, my, I, I, I wrote a paper on this, uh, which was, uh, which is called Finance for a Regenerative World. It's on our website. It's really a book. Um, and, and what I tried to do with that is begin with the same first principles, the same eight principles, and allow the, the, the implications to go where they go. So um, what, do those, what do those principles tell us about how the financial system needs to change in order for the financial system to be aligned with how living systems work? And the first the first thing is to get clear on the right relationship between the financial system and the real economy. And, and that, that alone is a, is a monstrous challenge because the f that we in finance have, have kind of gotten accustomed to the idea that capital allocations direct the economy. When in fact, the financial system logically needs to be understood as a subsystem of the real economy and in service to the real economy. Um, but but we flipped that inside out. Literally in my lifetime or my career on Wall Street, that that became inverted. And uh, so so getting clear on that right relationship again, drawing on one principle is is the place to start. And I'll just use one other quick example. You know, I think most people uh, intuitively sense that the market, the financial markets, have become a speculative casino, and that can't be good for the health of the economy. And so, you know, we're in an ideological, ideological battle between, well, should we regulate that back or should we allow free markets to be free markets because free markets are the path to efficiency and efficiency is the path to economic growth and economic growth is the path to prosperity. But if you look at that question of speculation and how much is too much speculation um, through the living systems lens, again, drawing on the principle of balance, the principles of balance and in right relationship, speculation by definition is a win-lose proposition. Uh, if I buy shares of Apple and they go up, I win. And if you sell them to me and they go up, you lose. So there's no right relationship between a speculative exchange. Whereas if I invest in say a wind farm and, um, and the wind farm is built and we transition off coal to wind, there are no losers. It's a win-win uh, thing. So, but but the way finance measures those two outcomes is simply how much money did you make? What's the internal rate of return? And um, so, if if I'm right that speculation is a win-lose extractive exchange as opposed to a regenerative exchange, well, that tells us we need to radically reduce the amount of speculation in the system. And that has nothing to do with whether I believe in free markets or not. It has to do with a desire to reset the financial system to be more aligned with how living systems work, just as one example. 
Lots can be done with the way we tax things. I mean, it, it just, the list goes on and on. But it also seems like, John, in what you're sharing, um, a recontextualization of what makes for a good investment. So the criteria in which, by which one would decide what is a good investment, um, it sounds like there's some underlying kind of hypotheses on your side that that needs to shift. And I'm curious if that's something you could articulate a little bit more about either through your personal lens or through the systemic lens. Yeah, I, I think the, the, that's a great, a great point, Adam. Um, the, the key difference is we need um, capital to, well, first we need to differentiate between all of the financial you know, speculation trading and the real capital flows that matter. So it's, it's not whether I buy or sell IBM stock or Exxon stock, it's whether Exxon keeps drilling holes in the ground to discover more oil or whether they put up wind farms, um, just to use a really trivial example. And um, so much of, the, much of the conversation about sustainability in finance has been around secondary markets. The whole ESG conversation is largely about secondary markets as opposed to the responsibility of those allocating capital into real investment decisions. And those allocation decisions are largely big companies, big governments, and very wealthy individuals. And I believe that at this moment in time, those who allocate real capital have an enormous responsibility to do that in such a way that is driven by systemic health as opposed to optimizing personal return. And that's asking a lot, right? Uh, that's, that's, not a, that's not a trivial challenge, um, but for those who have, you know, the, the easy example to pick on is billionaires and sovereign wealth funds. These are pools of surplus capital that have the response ability to do anything they want. They can respond in any way they want. And, um, and that's, where the, that's where capital flowing in the way the system needs it to flow needs to happen. And I've been practicing this with my own investment uh, portfolio for years. And I can attest that it's very possible to do this in a way that's responsible to the financial return needs or desires of the individual investor while investing in systemic health creating um, uh, situations and opportunities. Um, and, you know, if we had more time, I could give, give everyone a couple of examples, but primarily this involves in investing in directly in companies that have an innovation or a business model that is, that creates not only um, a direct positive impact, but also systemic changes as opposed to, you know, um, it, it, it's one thing to do something that reduces carbon. That's a great thing. It's one thing to do something that in, improves access to um, health care. But if you can find opportunities that actually have as, a, as an outcome, an unintended outcome even, something that shifts uh, the system towards systemic health, that's, a, that's the win. And, and let me just make, make it concrete. So one of my projects that I'm involved in is an aquaponics business that grows tilapia in inside circulating tanks. So it's, it's a fish farm. Um, the, the tilapia uh, waste feeds the, a shrimp tank, a, the shrimp waste feeds a mollusk tank, and the waste from that um, uh, goes into a, a greenhouse, and the heat in the greenhouse circulates back into the fish tank. That all sounds great, circular economy, you know, reduced overfishing, all these good things that impact investors like to see. But the real key to it is, is that tilapia are a grass-eating fish. So if we can displace um, consumption of chicken that eat uh, annually grown grains, which destroys the grasslands with tilapia protein, which eat perennial grass-grown uh, uh, grain or grass-grown inputs, you then create demand to be growing perennial grasses which sequesters carbon, which creates the systemic benefit that has nothing to do with the protein that we're eating. So it's that kind of thing that we need to identify and then ideally create public policies that encourage and create public policies that discourage the ones that have the opposite effect, which is 
turning a perennial grain, a perennial grassland into a cornfield to feed chicken cheap grain, which has the opposite systemic consequences. And that's of course the system we've set up and is dominating our, our food system today. So get used to eating tilapia. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I uh, <laughs> tilapia fish. I love somebody put the Wikipedia fake Lake Michael. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Um, so uh, I know that there are some additional questions, John, and I don't know if you have a hard stop at uh, at uh, nope. two fifteen your time. Nope. So I'm going to suggest because I know some people will have to leave and we'll have people start dropping off. That um, for those that have questions and want to stick around, everybody is welcome. If John, you have a few minutes, and we can take start with Marcel and uh, Luke's questions. Then I did want to make sure that we give a little bit of space for um, in rhythm to um, share any closing words, uh, and then I know John would like to share a reading, and uh, and then I can wrap us up uh, at our fixed time. Yeah, thank you, Adam. I'm just laughing at the chat right now and all the chatter going on about tilapia and carp. <laughs> yeah, I have um, to agree with carp comment. <laughs> I mean, I just have to say I love the humor. I'm enjoying the humor element of this. I feel like we have to have a good sense of humor in order to usher in a regenerative economy. And so I think it's kind of a fitting ending. Um, and I'm just yeah, very grateful for the solvable team for putting this together. John, for you to share your wisdom and everyone here for taking the time. I think um, the, the takeaway I'm just sitting with is more direct investment in projects that are creating systemic health um, as the last part of this conversation. I really appreciate that. And yeah, I'll leave it at that. I know we're almost at time, but thank you all really are grateful for the space. And thanks everyone for being so engaged in this conversation. This was awesome. I'll just while we're before we start on a couple of questions, uh, just to reflect on Jen's great comment, um, you know that there are many uh, private family-owned businesses, particularly in Europe and in in Latin America, that do things much more responsibly, much more regenerative, just naturally, than public companies that are that are having to, you know, um, report to quarterly earning demands of public uh, speculators and. Um, Unfortunately, particularly we in the United States have in, have exported our short term market driven capital markets efficient capitalism and and told these European family businesses, oh, you need to get with the program and get modern and get public and and um, so we, we've we've damaged a lot of the healthy uh, cellular uh, strength of the economy in the process and um, it's not to say that private companies are the solution. Um, there are good and bad private companies, but it's certainly a lot easier to do the kinds of things we need to do in a private company than it is in a, in a public company. Do you want to share your reading, John, or would you like to, uh, you feel yeah, like just, it fits? Did you want to, me did to, you want to uh, do a couple questions or I see a couple hands up? I think, um, where are we out of time? Well, I think we're almost out of time. So I want to um, just, because people are starting to drop off in the official part of the session, and then we can go to Q and it okay. kind of Q and A after if that's sure. okay. Sure. Yeah, so I, I thought I'd read something from um, David Baum's on dialogue. And uh, the context for this is that um, suddenly the universe has thrown this idea of dialogue at me from multiple directions. So um, it just feels like its time has come, but this was written decades ago. David Bohm was a, a world-class physicist, um, hung out with Einstein and, and folks like that. And um, he got very interested late in life in uh, the challenge of our thinking and its, con its, its um, impact on our ability, our decision-making and our ability to um, survive as a, as a society really. And, um, and so at, when we're at this inflection point of sort of having to grapple with shifting worldviews, shifting paradigms, and most people and most institutions kind of locked in an old paradigm, um, it's, uh, it's an urgent call for the art of dialogue. And um, so in our course, we're actually going to experiment with dialoguing as a way to create new shared meaning. And um, so I'm, I'm going to read a couple lines from 
a section of On Dialogue, which is titled A New Culture. A society is a link of relationships that are set by people in order to work and live together. Rules, laws, institutions, and various things. <clears throat> it is done by thinking and agreeing that we are going to have them and that we do it. And behind this is a culture, which is a shared meaning. And I'll skip on a little bit. Um, I am saying society is based on shared meanings, which constitute the culture. If we don't share coherent meaning, we do not make much of a society. The important thing is that we will never come to truth unless <clears throat> the overall meaning is coherent. And then finally, this section of the book ends. I think that something like this is necessary for society to function properly and for society to survive. Otherwise, it will all fall apart. This shared meaning is really the cement that holds society together. And you could say that the present society has some very poor quality cement. If you make a building with very low quality cement, it cracks and falls apart. We really need the right cement, the right glue, and that is shared meaning. Thank you. That was a beautiful, uh, beautiful piece on the, the power and importance of dialogue in creating these space of possibilities. Hugely appreciative, um, John, for all of your contributions in this conversation, for Ernesto, for what you brought into it, as well as hosting, to, uh, to Alex and Jen from the In Rhythm team for hosting with us, and to Charles and James for also moderating. Uh, the the piece I wanted to close with is um, is a is a co this conversation around the limits and the limitless. Which, if you haven't read um, Tim Jackson's work out of Cusp, uh, he recently wrote a book called Post Growth: uh, Life After Capitalism, which I would highly recommend. In the, on the in the chapter on on limits, he he has a, what I thought was a really beautiful quote, which was, "Beyond our material limits lies another world, a place worth visiting." an investment worth making, a destination worth reaching. Tomorrow is another country. They do things differently there, beyond the limits to affluence that only limits can reveal, reveal to us. Limits are the gateway to the limitless. And with that, I want to thank That's everyone very, uh, for joining us. <laughs> Pardon? Very roomy-esque. Ruby, yes, totally. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. If anybody needs to hop off, um, please feel free. And um, otherwise, for those that want to stay on and have been very patiently waiting to ask questions with hands up, we will uh, we'll circulate around for as long as um, John has, has time for. So uh, maybe I'll go to um, uh, Marcel and then Luke and then uh, Michael. Okay, thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you, John, for the insights. Um, at the end, you mentioned that uh, uh, the public policy should be aligned with, uh, with, with the activities, and I agree fully with it. And I think that it's best that we stop crying about the fact that our system is broken, uh, and let's start fixing the, the system with the right rules. But the only thing is that we have a big system, and we need a, we have a very big transition ahead. So when we have to throw all, all away and we have to do something in five years, 10 years, 15 years time, we have to do it very quickly. And what I would, uh, it's a little bit uh, too short for, for this discussion. We have developed a, a future coefficient where we, which indicates how much the activities in society are aligned with our future goals. And when you have quick learning cycles, you can adjust the rules in the game very quickly to make sure that the activities are inherently aligned with society. And uh, I think that could be a great way to go forward because we need to have good learning cycles. Mm. Yeah? And at the moment, we mi are missing that. So Yeah, I totally agree. If you could share that with Alex and I, I'd love to, to take a look at that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll put the, um, there is a block. Uh, on, uh, on the on the topic, I'll put it in the uh, in okay. the in, in the chat, and then uh, great, uh, thank please, you. Please 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 contact, and then I would love to chat uh, further. Yeah, and the, and the we, we have an expression in our own regenerative communities network called "learning to learn together." Um, yeah, well, that's exactly which, which speaks exactly to what, what you're saying, I think. Yeah.
and I'm trying to work that with the institutional investors in in the Netherlands and in Europe, and setting up some uh, yeah a pilot for mm -hmm. for doing so. Yeah, I mean, and it's important. This is different than teaching people stuff. This is we're all having to learn a new way of seeing, a new way of thinking. And um, the 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 tendency is that the kind of consulting model here's here's the answer, here's the framework, here's how to apply it. Now go do it. That's not going to work on this one because uh, all the contexts are unique. So it's it's really learning how to learn again, um, which and is even, a challenge. And even unlearning, right? I feel like so many of us have, I mean, I can speak for myself, but <laughs> so much unlearning to do from all the things we've learned throughout our lives. And how do you create conditions for yourself to just unlearn and then relearn? And I think community coming back to that theme is such a great place to do that because um, deep learning happens when you're in community. Mm -hmm. From each other. Right. Yeah, and in, in Bohm's book, he talks a lot about how we think. We don't really understand how we think. We think we know how we think, but we don't actually understand how we think and how we therefore communicate. Um, so it's it's a lot. I like that thought. So uh, I put uh, contact details in the in the chat, and uh, I'm running for thank another you, so. contact. So thank you. This great evening. Luke, are you still there? You want to ask? <laughs> yes, Hi. thank you, thank you, Adam. <clears throat> thank you, John, for your your time this, this evening, where I am. But for your time, it's, it's been great, really inspiring. And um, my my question really is that, <clears throat> excuse me, the the background to it was I love hearing about projects like you just described, John, um, <clears throat> and, I, and I love it. it, it causes me to be more optimistic than depressive. Hmm. Um, however, I do think this, it all, the, you know, these sources of optimism is actually, it's not really going to move things as quickly and as productively as I think is the ever increasing necessity of urgency of the situation the world is in. So trying to think on, on a modular general thing that could actually it, it enable this, um, this act, sorry, these actions um, is if we sort of rewind back to the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, the format of accounting uh, created this externalities, internalities issue. And if that that core flaw in our industrial revolution was corrected by some country somewhere to, that created a model of this is the accounting system now, including the now externalities. So this is the true cost, the true cost mm -hmm. of whatever it is you're doing. I just wonder if I'm being too much a romantic, but I would ask you, is that the kind of thing that might have a, a strong effect. Because then we have the true cost of meat, whether it's, it's mm. factory farmed or whether it's sustainably farmed, the true cost of a bottle of wine, the true cost of a building, the true cost, the true cost, the true cost of my my hour traveling in a car, if it's petrol, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it's a great point. And, and it, like any of these things, it's a paradox. I mean, of course, putting accurate prices on products is a kind of no brainer. We should do that. We should have unified systems to do that and common ways to think about it. Um, but I, I'll, I'll go to one of my teachers um, view on this, Dana Meadows, who if, if you're not familiar with it, she wrote a brilliant, she's the lead author of Limits to Growth. She was a system scientist at MIT back in the 70s. And she wrote a brilliant paper that got turned into a book called Places to Intervene in a System. And so someone asked her kind of exactly this kind of question. So, you know, if we could do one thing, what would be the, what would be the, 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 the laser beam uh, thing to focus on? And, and issues like accounting and measuring is certainly on the list. But the point of her 10 point um, response was she gave it an inverse order of importance. And um, she ends with 
the, the, the second most important thing is the goals of the system. And the most important thing is the paradigm within which the system exists. And so I think I personally have chosen to work on this paradigm level in large part based on the inspiration of this uh, paper that turned into a book, because she would argue that, uh, and this I think is what's happened, because we haven't shifted the paradigm, all of the work that has already happened around true cost accounting and ESG and triple bottom line and all that stuff, and there's, a, there's an industry of stuff working on that for decades now, but it hasn't gotten the traction it needs because we're still operating out of the old paradigm. So until we shift the worldview or the paradigm, um, and then it'll become obvious that of course we have to adopt these different kind of accounting, but we're still stuck in the old paradigm and so we're resisting it. And, and even John Elkington who coined the term triple bottom line got frustrated that you know we talk about it, but at the end of the day, uh, we have a single bottom line and then we have some information we report on, on other bottom lines. So, so I, I think the, I think the, I think the shift in narrative is, is in the worldview is, is the, the critical uh, piece we need to do while we do all of the other stuff at the same time. And, and just as a final thought, just as a reminder to us all, Dana then wrote, Oh, by the way, there's one thing more important than shifting paradigms, which is not to get attached to your paradigm. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but you know, that's the challenge is we're, we're all humans and it's so human to attach to a paradigm, the modern worldview paradigm, the paradigm that capitalism is the best system and it beats socialism, the paradigm that, you know, the planet is here for us, for our, our you know, pleasure and, and et cetera. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks. Interesting, John, because that reminds me of the last solvable session on, and there was a lot about storytelling and really the paradigms that we uh, have in our minds are the stories that we as individuals yeah. and as cultures tell ourselves. And so I think that's kind of a beautiful tie into some of the other solvable totally. sessions. We, we, we did seven years of storytelling at Kaplan Institute for just that reason. And I, I, I yearned for the kind of the killer blockbuster movie um by james um um what's his name uh the movie guy you know cameron, that was sort of james cameron yeah, james cameron that would suddenly yeah. overnight shift our paradigm but i i suspect it's many stories that are that are that are uh, unique to different contexts that will shift it um but i i do believe just like the berlin wall fell, fell i do believe it it will eventually shift and and the good news is that the, the systems change in response to pressure. So the worse things get, the higher the probability of a shift becomes. On, on, on that note, John, and sorry to interrupt everyone, but on that note, um, in discussion with a friend of mine the other night, um, he sort of said, the thing is that we humans uh, won't even uh, react when the, when the tiger is in the room. We won't even suddenly then behave. It's only yeah. when the tiger is actually eating our face <laughs> well there's probably some truth to that yeah so we'll see thank, thank you john thanks thank you luke thank you uh let's see sorry i have michael i think was next are you still with us michael yeah i'm here all right yeah, yeah. so i'm just uh uh curious about like uh we had this conversation in our group about uh, how money has replaced the true understanding of what an economy is. And I shared a, a link that I f find really fascinating that it was updated last year. All the world's money visualized uh, in the chat uh, is early up there. And like so many people don't realize that money now is so, so many levels removed from what the real economy is. And uh, many people think that you, if you just can invest in Bitcoin or the stock market, you're set for life and that, that's the way to live. But if 100% of us spend our days investing, there would be no one else doing doing anything. So, and how do we get back to that story that the economy is, is about people doing things? Uh, you know, I mean, I couldn't agree more with you. I, um, you know, the, the, the extreme version of that is people get a PhD in physics and go, 
work on speculate speculating in hedge funds um, rather than using physics. So I, I don't I don't know how we. Well, I, I, I here's here's my here's my thought on how it will happen. Is I think it's a generational shift. I, I think I know for sure that big banks and and hedge funds are having a harder time attracting young talent. Um, and um, and I think the 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 excitement in finance is moving into this whole new crypto world, and within the crypto world, there will be all of the bad stuff played out all over again. But there's also uh, the possibility for much more profound, innovative, system changing, good stuff. Um, you know, just yesterday or the day before, I learned about a a company that is enabling all of us to keep our data in here and uh, have it be um, uh, commercialized for good purposes. And we receive 85% of the benefit of, or the, or the value of that rather than 85% of the value of it or not or hundred percent of the value of it going to Facebook or Google or whoever. And so I, I think there's a generational shift, just like, you know, I, I came up when spreadsheets I could do a spreadsheet and my boss couldn't. The kids that are born now where they grow up with the internet and soon grow up with this whole decentralized crypto thing, it changes the way they think. And, and some of it's gonna be a disaster. Some of it already is a disaster. But um, my guess is that we're not gonna go into Goldman Sachs and cause people to change their behavior. Uh, people are gonna walk out of Goldman Sachs and do something different. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I don't know if that's helpful, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but any, anything, anything that raises this conversation everywhere is helpful. So yeah, no easy answer for sure. I do think that just to suggest that um, there, and John had alluded to this at the beginning of the conversation, the the broad groups that are working around exactly these this kind of these questions and the convening spaces which seem to be getting much there are many more of them for uh for and i think that that is the space you know per what you shared with bohm's um dialogic relationship to narrative and understanding is that those these are absolutely necessary for us to kind of unwind and be able to sense into into what is possible yeah. So, um, and, you know, I referenced Graber's book and I, I, I think that the, we didn't get a chance to really talk about the myths, but we, we, and there's obviously myths, you know, books entirely devoted to myths, like Matsukata's book has a whole section on myths, um, the Denise Hearn's book on the myth of capitalism. Um, we're, we're slowly kind of demystifying some of these pieces that are really have been integral to our worldview and i think john as you suggest we will a generation will look back on our myths and think that they were preposterous <laughs> right right i couldn't believe they were so stupid <laughs> yeah yeah you yeah. know i i do think we're at the very rudimentary level i mean put, put it this way i have a, a a guy i know in the regeneration space who's been in it longer than I have, um, kind of architecture background. And he said he spent, I think it was six weeks with an indigenous uh, community in Australia. And he felt like he was, you know, uh, his, his appreciation and understanding of regeneration was like kindergarten level compared to what he experienced. Um, so mm -hmm. we're, we're probably only scratching, scratching the, the edge of it here. Thank you. Um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, Shik. Is um, did you want to share a question as well or thought? Yeah, thanks, Adam. And yeah, Shik's fine. Um, sorry for my video not being on. It's one a.m. here, and it's a bit <laughs> dark. Um, I'm impressed, Shik. So, thanks for being with us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm I'm really glad that I got to be here. I've been super um, inspired and resonated with all of the vibrations that's been flowing around. Um, so my question is kind of around. Um, the, the pertinent thing around how do we simultaneously sort of transform systems and also create the new alternative systems that we know are necessary. Um, I'm coming from the perspective of, um, uh, I'm working on a project called Environmental Global Governance, where we're trying to go above the nation state and establishing a new specialist 
body that explicitly serves the protection and restoration of the biosphere. And in doing that, we realized that nation states cannot continue to hold the power in making decisions, right? Um, we have to go above them if we have to truly have regenerative circular economies that are bioregionally based and that are community based, that are decentralized patchwork um, network systems. So my question is, uh, you know, like, do you believe that it is possible to co-opt the system as the system has been co-opting us for the last, let's say, hundred years and ever ever since nation states came about and post-colonialism started happening, in a in a way where we can actually um, enable reclamation of power and of um, ability by communities and people um, around the world while also not creating spaces for violence, which is the most common response of the system against reclamation of power, especially mm. in the global south. Um, yeah. yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? Boy, um, well, first, thanks again for sticking with us, joining us and sticking with us. Um, uh, I, I just first would, would agree with your premise um, that, you know, the nation state was designed to promote the self-interest of nations. And it should be no surprise to us that the, the UN construct is failing to achieve global consensus around issues like climate change that have urgency and that are not national interest issues, but, but are global communal issues. Um, so, you know, it's easy to say, but yeah, we need a different construct. Uh, I totally agree with you that a bioregional weaving of bioregionally, um, you know, bioregion is, is place only big enough that it can be impactful. And so uh, we actually launched a bioregionally based regenerative community network, network uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the pandemic dampened its growth, but there's a lot of energy uh, in this group of folks who are who are acting out this need to create a bioregionally based uh, alternative to um, uh, self-governance and and empowered participation. Um, I think I think the one of the keys to um, enabling that could well be this idea of creating a universal quote unquote universal basic income, some some buffer, some cushion, some margin that enables people to act in a way that's other than simply how do I survive through this week um, that would enable that to happen. And, and so again, some of the things I see happening in 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 the crypto world uh, are are quite promising in that regard because the the whole global monetary system is is it's not designed to cause uh, power to to be distributed. Um, you know, you have just like you have wealthy people that have the power because they're wealthy. You have wealthy countries that hold the power because they have the wealth. And the way that wealth is currently transferred is via debt, which isn't it's, it's not, it doesn't work. Um, if, if, a, if a country has dollar denominated debt, uh, it's strapped in a worse place probably than when, when before it had the debt. Um, but there's a, there's a whole uh, realm of possibilities by creating complementary and alternative currencies that can keep that power uh, locally grounded. It's a huge challenge and, and conversation, um, but I, I think you're on to the right, I think you're on the right path and I, I wish I, I could articulate a, an easy way for that to happen. Uh, and, and in fact, I, I have to say that um, the, the, the consequences of our breaching planetary boundaries and the ripples that that will cause, um, like climate change itself, are going to exacerbate the, the, brill the brittleness of what are today emerging economies. So um, I have to say, I, I, I have great concern about how this transformation plays out. Just, it, you know, look at what happened with the pandemic. I mean, it, you know, that's the same thing. You, it, it affects the least resilient areas the worst. And, um, uh, and so it's imperative that the, the, uh, these innovations begin on the ground in 
all parts of the world, um, and and um, and then we get going on that work quickly. But there's there's actually some interest um, uh, seek in, in seek in 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 creating kind of a a a version of our course targeting just specifically India. Um, and um, you know, there's brilliant people in India that have been thinking about these issues. I I had the privilege to visit India six or seven years ago, maybe more. Um, and I was blown away at the level of thinking that I encountered in, in, in various circles there. So um, anyway, it could be that, it, that, that a place like India is where we actually figure out how to do this uh, in a way that's, that's meaningful in dealing with the, the power issues. I yeah, realize thanks, that brought up thanks. an entire question around redistribution, which we haven't talked about at all. And that's an entire another uh, yeah. conversation. Sorry, she I maybe cut you off there. No, I just wanted to affirm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm Indian, so I have a little bit of bias, but also much of the research what we've done around trying to float this sort of alternative new institution of the nation state points to the fact that it has to start from India because of demographic reasons, diversity reasons, but bi biogeographical reasons. So yeah, it'd be very interesting yeah. to learn the work you're talking about well it's you you've just raised the game three or four levels of complexity so uh thanks for staying with us with that i think um john we're i'm hugely appreciative of you stayed on as long as you did thank you uh, you're thank welcome you so thanks thank, thank you to everyone you, Adam, else thank you everyone who's, who's stuck around thanks alex thanks ernesto <laughs> Thank it was a pleasure uh, to be with everyone. I want to wish everybody a very uh, healthy, restful holiday season. We will be reconvening on uh, January 6th for a conversation with Australian Dominique Hess on regenerative cities, and that's going to be brilliant. So if, uh, if you're interested in the conversation specifically that we started with communities around cities, please do join us. Uh, everything is on our website, which is solvable.ca. And uh, hope everybody will stay well and we'll see you in the new year. Thank you again, John and InRhythm team. Thank you, everyone.